It was my second week of chemistry class in high school, and I thought, yeah, this is really something I think I'd like to do. So uh, to, for me to be where I am now and to be teaching at the local university, I tutor online through a, a website, and I do that 10 to 20 hours a week with AP students across the country and honors chemistry students. And to be engaged in chemistry anywhere from 60 to 80 hours a week is like, how could I ever guess that when I was like younger, you know? And I really love every minute of it. Uh, somebody says, well, that's just too many hours. I said, not, not when you think about it, not when it's the passion of what you do. So it's been a lot of fun. It's been a, a good ride. And um, I'm happy to be working for PRISM. We are actually a, um, a DBA. We're doing business as PRISM. We were purchased by Montrose Environmental Groups approximately three years ago. And uh, we are actually a portion of Enthalpy Laboratories out of North Carolina. Um, and so we're happy to be part of that organization and it's been really good uh, being associated with Montrose. So what I'm gonna do tonight is to talk about how VOCs impact us, especially formaldehyde. You know, a lot of people don't realize that formaldehyde is somewhat the silent uh, respiratory killer in a way, because even though you know, we, we, we worry about VOCs and we worry about off-gassing from all the uh, like materials of construction that are in a building. One of the things that's overlooked a lot is the impact of formaldehyde. It's the, one of the smallest organic molecules. It embeds in your, in your lungs and can do damage, especially for people with multiple chemical sensitivities or um, just even a chemical sensitivity. Uh, it can be impacted and have respiratory distress from the f impact of formaldehyde. But what I'm here, besides just formaldehyde though, you know, a lot of you are designers and I've got information regarding you know, VOCs that come from materials of construction and how you can, what, what, what can we do about that and you know, how can we better uh, prepare um, or design a, a building for instance. Um, so, so what I'm going to do, yes. Are slides going to be available? Um, yes, but I, not tonight because I couldn't get my um, PRISM logo to, to fit on the bottom. I, I was having problems with that, so I want to make sure I got them off the Curtis. And so I will provide Curtis with a copy, and then he can distribute it to anybody who needs it. It'll probably take me like until the beginning of next week, but I will definitely have them available for you if you'd like them. Thank you. All right. So anyway, um, I was mulling over the, this, this title like changed like multiple times in the past couple of days. But so really it's formaldehyde and VOCs and the impact in indoor air quality. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, these were just my learning objectives. So it's not really a, a decent slide, but for the most part, I, I just wanted you to understand why formaldehyde is a, um, essentially a silent threat to respiratory disease, especially for those who have respiratory illnesses. You know, there are people, we, we receive phone calls about people who, can't figure out why they're not feeling well, you know, and so they're in the, their indoor environment. You know, some, some people are shut-ins, they're, they're there all the time. And so they're being exposed to whatever VOCs are being off-gassed from the materials of construction around them. Um, so I also wanted to talk about the sources of formaldehyde and other VOCs and then understand how formaldehyde is monitored briefly on that. Um, and then finally, how can it be remediated, but possibly never entirely eliminated because formaldehyde is everywhere. It seriously cannot be totally eliminated. It's just, there's just too many sources of it. If you have wood somewhere, there's gonna be formaldehyde coming from that wood. Now, the key is to keep the source, you know, keep your environment with good refreshing air exchange and that kind of thing to minimize the damage that any kind of VOCs can have. And there have been some well-known cases in the past couple of years. Weyerhaeuser just recently uh, with their, um, they, they had some kind of a beam coating that they put on uh, new con home constructions and that beam was off-gassing like thousands of nanogram per, per liter of formaldehyde. Also the lumber liquidators issue from a couple, you know, four years ago or so with the, the flooring and that kind of thing. So there are a lot of issues out there and uh, let's, let's dive in. So formaldehyde itself is actually the, approximately the simplest organic molecule. I say approximately, there, there are some small ones that might be um, short-lived, but containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen is very highly reactive, and so when it gets into your system, it can react very quickly with water to form methylene glycol, but once it's in your system, it can do damage as far as respiratory illness goes. Um, but we have multiple natural and man-made sources where formaldehyde can come from, and I'm gonna take a look at some of those and also talk about acceptable levels, but at the same time, saying acceptable levels there really aren't necessarily acceptable levels because there are so many guidelines out there right now about what's an acceptable level. Who says one thing? I mean, who being the World Health Organization. Um, 
who says one thing and then uh, the, um, who is it, the, and NIOSH. NIOSH says it should be like 20 nanograms per liter, which is like almost impossible to attain. Uh, that outdoor air has approximately 5 to 10, 10 nanograms per liter, depending on where you are. Uh, wooded areas provide, our body converts ethanol into acetaldehyde, and that's why we feel sick the next morning. It's the acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde in your system. But it is a concern, the primary concern is inhalation of these things, not ingestion. Uh, so that's one thing we have to remember, that inhalation is what really is the, is the issue here. Um, but before we discuss formaldehyde further, let's take a little bit of a look at air quality statistics. Uh, VOCs are always about, you know, anywhere from two to five times higher in indoor air than they are in outdoor air. Outdoor air is diluted by the world, essentially. Uh, so if you took a, an air sample, you essentially are taking an air sample and it would be less than 200 nanograms per liter. But when you're trapped indoors, and with new construction being as efficient as it is, we are actually trapped with more indoor VOCs than we used to be. The best homes for VOCs and formaldehyde are the oldest homes that you can imagine because they're, they don't have any good seal and they, they just leak out the VOCs like they leak out the energy. So, so the more you have of leakage, the better off you are as far as your VOC levels go. Um, always an interesting point. So, and then certain activities may increase VOCs a thousand times. I, we had an inspector that sent in a sample one saying, I just wanted to check this out. He said, I know my level last time was 400 nanograms per liter. I just used some personal care products and I took a sample. I wanted to see what it is now. 1800 nanograms per liter within the first couple of hours after using that. So we are kind of, you know how they used to say you are what you eat. You also exist in an environment that you created. So you create, you know, the VOCs sometimes, especially by new building construction and things like that. Um, and then in, indoor VOCs are three or four times higher in the winter than in the summer, again, to the fact that, you know, you have your home, homes closed up for the most part. We also spend a lot more time indoors these days, you know. Um, so the, these various things really encompass air quality. So just to say that VOCs are the culprit, you know, it wouldn't do justice to the fact that all these other um, issues exist, particulate, uh, allergens, um, occupant comfort, temperature humidity. So I'm not talking about all those, but I want you to know, obviously, those are part of indoor air quality as well. And I don't want you to think that we're overlooking all that. And it's actually there, but it's not what we do. We do air testing and using uh, for VOCs and formaldehyde. And by the way, if you have any questions along the way, I'm happy to answer it. Uh, I just don't want to get caught in a, like a side, side conversation, but feel free to do that. Um, so what can affect indoor air quality? You know, obviously chemicals that you introduce into the home, uh, some of them are introduced by, I mean, the most recent thing is the uh, spray foam insulation. Uh, spray foam insulation has been a very big issue as far as, especially in situations where people don't know how to install spray foam insulation. It's the lack of understanding by the companies that provide that service that could lead to issues down the road. Most spray foam insulation uh, issues disappear after the first couple of weeks because that's, you know, usually you have some kind of uh, off-gassing maybe of a, uh, of a blowing agent that could be used for part of that. But when it's misapplied and it's not properly providing the structure it's supposed to uh, provide for the home, it could be off-gassing for years. And literally, I mean, two to three years later, you could still see high levels of blowing agents coming from that. And it's probably not doing its job either, but people are effect being affected by those VOCs. And then mold, allergens, particulate dust, I'm not really trying to gloss over those, it's just not really uh, the emphasis of the talk tonight, but those are all things that can affect indoor air quality. Um, but recently, again, I mentioned earlier about energy efficiency, you know, you're, you're building better buildings. And so it's really important to make sure due diligence, that we do due diligence to finding the proper materials of construction, and you don't want them to be inferior products. If you decide to uh, use an oriented strand board from China uh, that maybe was manufactured in a very poor way, then you're gonna be providing whatever occupant is gonna in, be in that building with formaldehyde off-gassing for a long time because they have to use glue to put those boards together along with plywood, other types of uh, you know, synthetic boards. Uh, and so you have to be really careful about materials of construction. Um, and so we have more synthetic materials than we used to have. And also, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we spent a lot more time indoors. 
and then there, I think um, I saw, I don't know where I saw the statistic, but in the past 10 years, there's been like a 60% increase in visits to uh, allergists, um, you know, just based on um, our lifestyles, I guess. Um, so this was just a, a slide to show that newer homes, you know, pretty much keep the bottled up effect of our, of whatever we're breathing inside and older homes emanate outward and pretty much provide you with a fairly clean zone. Um, I tested my, my mother's old 120 year old home before we sold it and it was like 300 nanograms per liter. It was really low, couldn't find anything in it. Um, but you know, then new homes, especially if they're brand new construction, you can have all kinds of VOCs that are present from some of that. Yes? Is there any data or research being, being undertaken to show homes that have um, makeup air and ERVs essentially that are constantly bringing in makeup air regardless of the regardless of the comfort of the heat and cooling? Yeah, um, we actually have several inspectors that have um, modified the homes they were working with using ERVs and provided, you know, sample tubes before and after, and definitely the VOCs came down with the introduction of 20% of fresh air um, and other improvements to their um, indoor air quality, you know, like, um, the circulation of the air. And also introducing air cleaners makes a difference too, depending on what kind of air cleaners you introduce. Right. So I that up because a lot of the homes that we undertake through passive house include that. Yes. Even code built homes. So if there's ever an opportunity where we could connect those homes that have that mm -hmm. to the work that you do, yes. we have a list. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. So situations with IOQ concerns include buying a new home. Uh, a lot of people want to know what are they buying. You know, it's, the biggest question is, did it used to be a meth house? You know, <laughs> unfortunately, meth is so hard to detect because it, it's a the meth goes away really quickly, and the ion the the mass spectrum of meth is not very effective at really identifying it very well. So yeah, we d typically can't tell. And all the solvents that are used are VOCs that you'd expect to see in a home anyway. I mean, there's a whole range of VOCs there just across the whole world now. You know, you see every single sample. I mean, right now there's ethanol, isopropanol, acetone. There's toluene in this room. People have gone to the gas station today. There are gasoline vapors in here right now. I mean, I guarantee it. You, you would see it in every sample, which is why, like, when we provide reports, it's, it's got those types of VOCs listed so you can see what you have. Um, so when you buy a new home, then, you know, the question is, is it a new home? Uh, the VOCs from new construction especially are concerned for formaldehyde emissions and that's why I have it in red because the red represents some of the formaldehyde issues but also um, formaldehyde you can go to like Lowe's or Home Depot right now and look at a like, look at a container of liquid nails the main ingredient is formaldehyde and, and you know that's off-gassing for at least the next couple of weeks when you introduce it so you have to really be careful with uh, people who are going to be susceptible to that and then hopefully you've uh, installed something properly, not you, but you know, the person doing the installation uh, has, has installed things properly so that it's not going to be off-gassing through like holes, in, you know, like like little seams in the floor or something like if it wasn't introduced properly. Uh, lumber liquidators, and I mentioned about the joist coatings earlier, that, that's part of the issue that, you know, the formaldehyde just keeps coming off and um, and some people have actually torn out their floors to to remediate. Now, we tried to have people, I mean, we, not we, because we, we're just the air testing lab. Um, but a lot of people do end up tearing out their floors and just putting in some kind of like stone or something just to avoid that in the future. Um, and then odors are also a concern. Odors, the problem with odors is that many times the threshold for how you can smell that odor is below the detection lim limit that we can see on our mass spectrometer instrumentation. So it might be in the part per trillion range and you can now smell it. Uh, the mercaptans that come from skunks, typically you can smell that in the part per trillion range and we would never see that on a, an instrument. So many times it's frustrating because you're trying to find that source and you realize that, oh, it's not really gonna be detectable because it's so low. You can still smell it, but we can't see it, if that makes sense. Steve, yes? Uh, just from a get a foundation of the levels that you're talking about, Mm -hmm. talking about parts per billion, parts per trillion, yes. and also nanograms per liter. Right? Yeah. I just want to try and get a, an educational basis. Right. Uh, nanograms per liter. 
So, tip, and I have a slide later for it, but I'll, tell, I'll talk about it now. Nanograms per liter is the same as the lead microgram per cubic meter. Okay, so that's the equivalent. Um, and in general, the VOCs that are found in indoor air are in the PPB range. So when you go to look at a NIOSH standard, you'll find out that those are in PPM range, meaning thousands of times higher. There aren't any good standards for homes. And that's the big problem is that you, all you have to go by is what OSHA or NIOSH provides, and it's nothing that's very good. And, you know, and then from formaldehyde, it's all over them. You know, anywhere from 20 to 100 is what they're saying for par parts per billion. And, you and said so your grandmother's home was 300 parts per billion. Billion of VOCs of everything. That's good. That's good, yeah. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. Well, green building good is 500, less than 500, so that's what you know, we're going by as far as saying good. So, all right, sure. Is that green building what? The green building standard for VOCs is 500, less than 500 microgram per cubic meter for the TVOC. And that's TVOCs above carbon six, okay? So hexane and above, which means, as I mentioned earlier to somebody, you can actually have um, 1,500 parts per million of, of isopropanol or ethanol in your home and you still have less than 500 on your TVOC because it's the C6 that they're talking about for that. Yes? So that being said, the building's constructed. Yes. It's finished. You guys do your testing. Then people bring in their shoes, mm -hmm. their clothes, and their furniture, deodorants, right. whatever they have. <clears throat> is, there, is there any group out there that is testing after that phase to show that Yes. The, you know, the variation and, and where that, where yes. it's kind of like, what's that for our peripheral? Right. So that would be a good segment for you to come in, if you don't mind, for a minute. Well, you can jump back. No, later. yeah, no, that's great. We were going to segue into Sarah coming up to mention a few things about that, but it really has to do with new building versus existing building. New building, people try to pass that because it's the easiest one to pass typically, especially for uh, formaldehyde maybe. But once you start bringing in all the furniture and everything, then it's, it becomes an issue because now you start having all kinds of VOCs that are coming in from materials of construction. And that's where you have to pass the existing building. All right, well, you, I mean, you, you can get the credit by, I don't understand it all. It's your turn, Sarah. <laughs> well, there's Here, really okay. Piece, right? Here, um, the green building certification um, in a commercial space. For lease. For lease, yep. And the video, sir, you gotta go. Yeah, you gotta go up and talk. Oh, yep. And before we go where you're going, <laughs> VOCs, right? They're volatile organic compounds. Vol volatile organic, I'm sorry, yes. So volatile organic compounds. Yes. Right. And then TVOCs, you're talking about total. Total volatile organic. And I also heard you say SVOCs. Yeah, the SVOCs we're not dealing with tonight. Those are the things that are beyond the total VOCs. They'll be like carbon 20 and beyond, typically. Okay, so heavier molecules. Heavier molecules, yes. Sorry about that. Good question. So we got kind of sidetracked. I don't even know where I'm supposed to start. Uh, just, you just wanted to mention about the different standards that are there for oh, lead and how. That's right. You were talking about the home itself. A a after, after, after all the construction people have finished mm -hmm. and, and you've done your testing, now said client moves in and they have stuff and they have a routine. What is the levels that you can expect to find once? That is a very good question. As far as LEED is concerned with green building, they do require that you're at 500 nanograms per liter total for VOC. That is pre-occupancy. That is a large part that we have to try to educate individuals on. Now homes, as you know, don't have any testing requirements in the sense of VOCs understanding what the home was before the occupant actually moves in is a greater impact on teaching them what their in what their actions are doing in that indoor realm so um, not to sell pitch there are plenty of laboratories out there that can actually complete analytical testing for VOCs um, ours especially we kind of separate what is from a building product versus what is from personal care product now there is some crossover in some of those chemicals um, Toluene can be in a lot of building products, but also can be in a lot of personal care. Formaldehyde's another. A lot of building products, but also in a lot of personal care products. So we kind of match those, chemically speaking, and that's where we're looking at the different molecular weights, the different VOCs, 
to say you have so much of A, B, and C, that's paint. This bunch of X, Y, Z is mothballs, whatever that case may be. So there is studies on that. Actual governmental studies, not that I'm aware. So does it, this sounds scary, because what you're saying is there's crossovers of what we find in construction to what we're putting on and in our bodies. There's a lot of crossover. So, I don't know about so anyone else. It, so, it's, I mean, it sounds like a good fun. approach like for a proactive building professional might be to do a, a test upon completion, to your point, and a, sort of establish a baseline and right. then do one maybe a couple months after people are That's what we, we have people doing that right now. Yeah. Because if they're invested in the building and the health of the building, I, I, I just jumped to conclusions. And I say, now you're also invested in yourself and right. the health of yourself and who's ever in your space. All right. But it sounds like it, it's a rough ride. It's interesting to try to educate. There was a couple of hands up. Go ahead. So there's a, I don't know if there's all this evidence like reset, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, do continuous monitoring. And they basically, if you drop out of compliance for more than a few hours, the, the certification. Reset was one of those first ones because I don't think LEED even does so at this point as far as a continuous monitoring. Well, reset might be well, well, mm -hmm. uh, You mentioned well, a different two. protocol for LEED for new construction versus E bombs. Yeah, e yes. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the difference? Uh, before, well, um, I'm not a lead AP. He could probably speak a little bit more to that than me. But uh, we do deal with a lot of situations in which we have existing buildings. The existing building certification for lead 4.0 or 4.1 at this point um, requires less VOC detection. So the uh, total has to be the same still, but there are less contaminants. So the VOCs have to be below a certain value, and they're looking at about 7 to 11, I think, individual components, where the new building design and construction is actually that 500 and a list of 35 other components. But it only used to be 4PCH, which is the from carpeting, and the TVOC. That was version 3. Mm -hmm. Okay. 3.1? As far okay. as VOCs are concerned, there's other constituents right. that you look for as far as right. the CO, the CO2, you look for the ozone in certain spaces and locations that you have to require that from. Yeah. But yes, homes is a tricky situation. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate that. All right. Um, so anyway, moving on then, other situations include changes in situations for people. New baby. Um, we see many times where people buy a baby crib comes from a less established store full of formaldehyde, okay? It's gonna be there forever. Might as well get rid of the crib. And I mean, those babies are gonna be exposed to a lot. I mean, literally. And there are also benzene products in some of these materials. Uh, some paints from uh, China, some paint has high levels of benzene in it. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm just saying that um, those would be some of the inferior products we would be expecting to see, just that kind of thing. Um, and then we have, uh, so the OSB and the laminates and glues do contain formaldehyde. And then the new product, any kind of furniture, could be possibly off-gassing depending on how carefully the manufacturer manufactured that, that piece of furniture. So a lot of times you can put on different coatings. Like I know, you know there are coatings out there that will mask VOCs and keep them sort of trapped in the system. People who had some floor issues with formaldehyde, they put on some flooring sealant and that helped a lot and kept the VOCs down. Um, so renovation also includes a lot of use of glues and adhesives and um, the other would be combustion. Any kind of source of combustion including fireplace usage and structural fires can produce a lot of formaldehyde from that. Um, so now the TVOC guidelines as we were being asked before is that it's a uh, Mojave is a Danish scientist who did some work involving looking at many samples including high, high numbers of VOCs. Um, he came down to the fact that you should be really probably less than 200 nanograms per liter for ultimate comfort. But anywhere from between 200 to 3000 is fairly acceptable except for the fact that if you have one component that's really high, like if you have a Two, you know, 2,000 nanograms per liter of naphthalene from mothballs, then that's going to be an issue. So that, that could be an issue with one big jump, you know, for one compound. 
Otherwise, you're definitely in discomfort if you're between 3,000 and 25,000 nanograms per level or per liter. Uh, that's considered to be the discomfort range, and there are many times when you can see those kind of VOCs as well. Especially uh, hair salons and um, any kind of, you know, and maybe industrial facilities that deal with solvents, a lot of times will have high levels of uh, TVOC. Um, so the green building uh, is 500. The Free-AM, which is the building research um, arm, uh, they, they suggest 300. Uh, is there a lot of BREEAM in this? I mean, do people do BREEAM at all? It's mainly, what? Europe. Okay, that's the Europe, okay. So yeah, it tells you that's why Sarah talked about lead. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, the challenge, and everybody is different. You can have an office of 25 people and one person could be having an issue with something that's in that building. And we get that all the time. And so you just have to be very careful that, you know, you have to kind of backtrack and find out what are they being exposed to. And maybe it's not VOC related. It could be in something else. It could be related to particulate matter. Um, but the most, usually the health effects are eye and respiratory irritation, dizziness, headache, and nausea. That's usually the, what people are complaining about when they're experiencing some kind of issues associated with VOCs. So it can range, you can have the same occupancy and a lot of people, most people will have no effect on it, but there could be something that's very highly toxic to an individual in there and you have to take everybody seriously. So. Um, as an organization, most organizations take care of their people. You know, we've had situations where people say, can you send me a kit? They're not doing anything. I want to stick it in my drawer, you know? <laughs> and so they put it in their drawer so they can get a TVOC reading so they can find out what they're breathing that's causing so much, so much problem because their, their, uh, their boss or employer is not willing to look into it. So we kind of try to steer clear of those kind of situations. And uh, anyway, it's an interesting. Now, this is kind of what we were talking about before, though. For indoor air, your, every building has a baseline. And that baseline is established by whatever materials of construction. So when you build, um, after like one or two days or maybe a week or two, the baseline has been established, okay? You start throwing in new, new furniture, et cetera, you have a new baseline. Now, then, it's what you do as a, an individual when you're living in that space that you introduce your own things like personal care products and everything else. So you have the baseline plus whatever perturbation. So if you looked, uh, we don't have a chalkboard, but you, you know, it could be like this, here's your baseline, but during the day it could be this, you know, for your TBOC, it could go up and down the entire day based on what you do as an individual or your family does. I have a really so, quick comment on that. Yeah. Does anybody Those, the aware's, yep. So that's kind of what that same process is. You'll see those peaks in the actual things right. that you do, but then that bottom line is going to be that baseline. So that's similar. Yeah. And so if your baseline goes to zero, then you need to readjust because there's no such thing as zero VOCs. Um, you know, like there's no such thing as a zero pollution, right? We know that. Um, so. That baseline also includes though, the local ambient outdoor levels, and they're usually typically pretty low for VOCs and formaldehyde, but there are people who live near fields, like farmer's fields, and they get a whiff of uh, whatever fungicide just got exposed, you know, and that's in their home as well. The worst part is when you have a fuel spill around your home, because that, that just impacts everything. Uh, and then the other thing that's not even in my talk tonight is whether or not you have uh, vapor extrusion from some kind of buried waste somewhere. So that's another thing that should be an issue. Um, but anyway, at the very end of the day, the very bottom line there on that last sentence is IAQ testing yields a snapshot in time of what's going on. It might be different the next day if you've done something that day. So if you're ever doing indoor air testing, you wanna make sure that the person who's in that home has not done something ridiculous like uh, went to Hobby Lobby and decided they're gonna do all kinds of glue work the day before on their hobby. You know, Then that's gonna be just a really a disastrous TVOC or you know situation for their home. All right, so just uh, briefly on these source types include building, occupant lifestyle, and natural or biological. And, and again, I'm not going to go through every single point here because I want to make sure we get through the important stuff in the slide. But I want to make sure you, you realize that the source types of VOCs are from these, 
and the building structure or operation is really one of the high the the, the big impact for building construction. Um, but these are just some general things that we see a lot, like fluorine gives you formaldehyde and all other solvents. Uh, vinyl fluorine gives you a compound called tetradecane, which is like carbon-14. Uh, cabinetry gives you toluene, xylenes, and formaldehyde, and you can get uh, contaminated drywall from uh, in, inadequate use of um, drywall construction can give you sulfur species, They're carbon, like carbon, carbon disulfide and carbonyl sulfide, which can be very stinky and cause issues. Paint, low and no VOC paints have lots of VOCs in them. They just don't have the VOCs that the government has regulated saying that those VOCs are the ones that impact the, um, the outside air. Okay, so VOCs have been removed. They're now considered to be gone and now you put in glycols and glycol ethers and then now those represent actual VOCs that are actually lower volatility, meaning they're going to stick around for a lot longer, maybe lower level, but they're going to stick around a long time. So low and no VOC paints have VOCs in them that will be like textanols and uh, other hydrocarbons, including glycols and glycol ethers. They're not necessarily bad, but they are something that's going to be something you have to deal with. Um, they're, they're truly not no VOC paints. Um, they're, they're safer from the perspective of you're not getting the, the highly volatile hydrocarbons that like um, uh, the xylenes and things. That, uh, spray paints always have xylenes in them. So spray paints won't, won't change. They have, you know, they have to be highly volatile so you can dry very quickly. Uh, but the, the wall paints are typically more along the lines of lower volatility, and so they're not, you're going to just have these glycols and glycol ethers now. Now the question is, how does that impact you? Just like the e-cigarettes the e now, you know, you have these propylene glycol. So how does that really impact our, our health? And, you know, there's going to be a lot coming down the line in the next year about e-cigs. So, you know, they're going to probably be just like cigarettes, and, you know, some, some places already banning them, so. So no BOT paints have the same types of chemicals? They have different chemicals. <laughs> but they're still volatile, but they're just not called VOCs according to the federal government VOC exemption list paints. So yes. from a health perspective, is it better, I mean, if you use VOC paints, they come off and get out faster? Yeah. Is it better to use those and if you're not living there? Like if you're, if you're not living there, you just want to... If you're doing it for a short time and giving them... Yeah, I understand. The ones that are going to off-gas for how long? Yeah. Do you have a comment? I do, well, so... You know, Oops, sorry. Oh, no problem. <laughs> No, it is great in that question. Actually, our lab director commonly says that if you use regular paint appropriately by airing it the way you're supposed to, it's actually going to be much better than the semi-volatile or the um, lower no VOC paints. What you have is a very volatile, formaldehyde is borderline very volatile where it always stays in a gaseous or close to. You have your volatiles and then you have your semi-volatiles and we kind of talked about that. So semi-volatiles are a bit heavier. What happens is instead of it off-gassing in say a year, you're going to off gas it over five years instead. So that's what you're doing when you start getting to more of those semi volatiles, they get a bit heavier and linger for longer. Thank you. And then uh, again, recently, as I mentioned, we have a spray foam insulation, which has been a real problem, especially if it's misapplied. Uh, but typically, you see a blowing agent. A blowing agent is typically, typically used to make the cell open up and expand. And then, um, believe it or not, they put, it's, it says trans, but most recently it's cis-1,2-dichloroethane, which really, when you breathe it, is really bad. Um, and so that's, that's been prevalent in some of these cis, uh, spray foam insulation applications. The reason it's there is because chlorinated compounds do not burn as well, and so it's, it's there to prevent flammability of your s solution as you're mixing it out. It actually is flammable, but just not as flammable as the mix you're putting in. Um, so the chloro, Chlorinated species typically will snuff out a flame. So, you know, you have a propagation of a flame through a free radical process, and that free radical process is killed by chlorine atoms and bromine atoms, which is why those are the types of atoms that are in uh, flame retardants. And that's why that's there. Well, CFCs are still used a lot, um, but, you know, we had, you had to then be careful about the ozone layer being destroyed. No, but that's why they were popular. Yeah, exactly. Non-flammable, exactly. And you were one of the things we see in a lot of the high-performance building is um, 
very distributed refrigerant lines, yes. DRF systems, et cetera. You have Freons out there. Can you talk about the type of VOCs that we see from refrigerants or leaks? Yeah, I mean, you typically just see, you know, I can't remember. I used to know the, the naming nomenclature, like 134A, what that meant. There's like one carbon, three hydrogens, uh, four fluor. But I, I don't remember all that now. But typically what you see is uh, just a chlorofluorocarbon in like a mass spectrum of it. But they're usually non -vol I mean, they're very volatile, but they're usually not considered to be hazardous to health. They're hazardous to more the ozone layer when they reach that layer. So. The guy who, from, from uh, GE, who invented it, used to go around the country inhaling it from, uh, just to prove it yeah. was safe because people were using ammonia before that. Yeah, yeah so, so you know how... Some standard that allows, um, that restricts you the volume of, yeah. of, of space exposed to refrigerant lines, right? So there's... Yeah, so you know, if you inhale helium, you sound like Mickey Mouse kind of, like with the helium. With those types of compounds, you inhale it, you sound like Darth Vader because it's much deeper in your lungs, you know, it's a deep, it's a heavier compound coming out. Um, it's, it's kind of funny, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not here to promote that. Um, so let's, let's move on. Well, the, actually... Actually, before you move on, um, with the spray foam, is there a blanket statement you can make about open cell versus closed cell or particular um, manufacturers of spray foam? Yeah, we've seen, I've seen less VOCs from isonine type water-based uh, systems. That's just just a general statement. I'm not promoting it. I'm just stating it. You know. Blanket yeah, blanket statement. Um, but again, it just depends on experience and application from the people who are applying it. Um, the other thing that they've recently been doing is repairing sewer liners with expandable polystyrene. And if somebody doesn't have a trap full of water in their sewer line, then they're going to get, uh, we've had people with 2,000 uh, PPB of styrene in their home from that, that repair. The liner goes out and expands across the cracks in the sewer liner and then the VOCs come up through the floor piping uh, if you don't have good water in your, in your trap. Probably the floor drain, yeah. Yeah, the floor drain, yeah, exactly. All right, so moving on, um, again, VOCs, contamination, these elevate, these will always elevate your TVOC above your baseline. Mothballs or moth crystals, they stay around forever. I have, somebody decided that mothballs are really good for, for sweaters. I've got a family heirloom, like one of those like wooden, looks like almost like a coffin. What's it called? It's a... I, thank you. I hope chest. That still smells like mothballs 70 years later. Okay, it still does. It will never go away. I've sanded it and sanded it, used solvents, it's never going to go away. We've given up. It's now, it now holds, it used to hold videotapes. Now it doesn't hold anything. Maybe someday a dead body, no, I'm kidding. Um, so then, oops, that's not what it was. So then we have uh, coatings and paints, kerosene, di the diesel and fuel oil spills in basements are the worst. They, they, stay, they are there for, they, they seem to be there forever and really high, you'll, you'll smell it for a long time. And then chlorinated solvents and toluene and xylenes, especially from spray paints, seem to be a problem. So again, as you're designing things and, you know, and you're recommending um, however you're going to do construction or whatever, this is, these are the things I would keep in mind as far as what you're using for materials of construction. You know, I, I, I think it's really important to make sure that you know, we, we build things with the, the best materials possible. Um, Steve, how bad are bleach and chlorox? You know, these, because hypochlor uh, bleach is like hypochlorite, it's an ion, so it's not really a VOC in the sense of the word. You would, you would detect that more with a, like a liquid chromatography type experiment. So we really have never seen many things from that, but it can generate, especially if you, you know, re happen to use ammonia at the same time, you can generate some gases and things that are not good for you. But in general, we don't see much from those because they're more like ionic compounds. Um, and chlorine, doesn't, it just goes right through our column, we don't see that. Um, so then the other thing would be the personal care products, and there's so much acetone and alcohol. And you know, if you ever look at an MSD sheet, you won't see very many hazardous materials. That doesn't mean that you don't have VOCs there. They just don't, they only have to list the ones that are on the list that could be causing some kind of health issue. And so a green cleaner, believe it or not, will contain as many different VOCs as you might imagine. And the person buying it thinks that they're not going to have anything except maybe water and something else in it. And it really has a lot of other um, VOCs that are there. Um, 
There was a professor at the University of Washington. Uh, her name is Ann Steinemann. She did a lot of studies on, on laundry detergents and things and about the VOCs that come from it. And you know, one of the worst actors also for respiratory issues are terpenes. Uh, these are like limonene, alpha-pinene, et cetera. And those come from wood. But believe it or not, they come from the wallflower odorizers that you plug into the wall. Those have been banned in the UK for schools because of respiratory distress for asthmatic children. So you can no longer use those odorants at public schools in the UK. I'm not sure if they use them here or not. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, you can, you can go to the gas station and now you just introduce VOCs into your home for gasoline, xylenes, benzene, et cetera. It's not avoid, it's, you cannot avoid that at all. There's no way to avoid it. It's getting on your clothing as you take the pump out of your, out of your car. I mean, they, they, they just adsorb onto your clothing. Well, there's and a solution then, right? Electric cars. There you go, yeah. You gotta worry about the EMS. Or, or, or new. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so back briefly to formaldehyde, then why do we care? It's the simplest molecule, highly reactive. Questions regarding carcinogenic carcinogenicity, very long word, began in 1980. So phenol formaldehyde resins began being phased out. You still find them in people's homes, but they are a big source of formaldehyde in homes, phenol formaldehyde resins. And those were very good, they had a very good R value but they also had a very good evolution of formaldehyde that nobody really seemed to think about. Um, now here's the funny thing. Formaldehyde on the left-hand side reacts with water immediately to form methylene glycol on the right-hand side. Now ethylene glycol is what we put into our radiator, okay? So it's one more carbon in there. Methylene glycol is what they put into hair straighteners at the hair salons. At a re fairly reasonable temperature, methylene glycol, when they go underneath that the astronaut dome, whatever you call it, what is that thing called the heat of the dryer, the hair dryer? Um, I, always call it, I always call it the astronaut dome. Anyway, when they, you go underneath there, the equilibrium shifts back to form formaldehyde because of the heat, so it's in, and that's what happens. So they are, people who work in hair salons are exposed to formaldehyde all the time and high levels of it. We're talking, you know, 200 to 1,000 nanograms per liter per day based on these hair straighteners. And I'm talking about things like Brazilian blowout and, you know, things like that. These are the ones that, like, will get, leave your hair, like, starched probably, you know. <laughs> I guess. That would be my guess. But anyway, the bottom line is the EPA has now said, or the, no, the chemical safety Lab, some chemical safety organization in the federal government stated that because methylene glycol will revert back to formaldehyde when used with heat, they are now considering them to be equivalent, even though they have different chemical abstract numbers, and the methylene glycol by itself is generally non-hazardous. But they look at them as equivalent because you can't prevent that conversion from happening to form formaldehyde. So there's a move out there for the people who use those or manufacture those to say, hey, they are different. It's not our fault that they have to actually dry the hair. <laughs> it's methylene glycol. We're, we don't have formaldehyde in our product. So it's like that. Um, anyway, so this is the Department of Labor hair salons, facts about formaldehyde and hair products. So I mean, all you have to do is just Google that, do a Google search on that, and you will get that information. And then the other sources include wood, resins and adhesives, some of the things I've already mentioned about. Um, plywood is a big thing. Cabinetry. We have people putting air, to, air sampling tubes into the cabinet and closing it up. It's really high for formaldehyde. Uh, it's a really big source. If you want to actually specifically test your floor, you can actually put a, an air testing tube on the floor and then take two chairs and put a little plastic cover over the top of it so you're only testing it near the floor because that's where toddlers are. And you can determine that, how much formaldehyde is there compared to in your room. So you take two samples and find out, yeah, it's really coming out of the floor. Uh, but the room kind of it dilutes it to a, a, a reasonable level. Um, and then this is like the makeup of a wood, you know, wood cells. And it just, it just goes to show that you know, cellulose does slowly decompose the form uh, formaldehyde over time. That's why it's always naturally decaying out of wood. The wood, after it's first uh, manufactured and you know, pressed and everything, it probably has the highest level then, but it does de deteriorate over time. Um, so the natural levels outdoor are 1 to 20, and normally indoors we see about 20 to 60 as an average. 
But again, it causes numerous um, respiratory issues, and especially of the nose, the ENT system. And um, it's carcinogenic to humans, classified as a group one carcinogen. But again, that, that definition is variable, uh, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, I, you know, th these are a bunch of sources. I'm not going to go through them all, but you can just see the formaldehyde can come from just about anything that has wood or some type of glue or adhesive or laminate product with it. Um, now, the reason I put this up here, just to point out one thing, and I can't point because this pointer doesn't go through the glass, but the inhalation says it's 0 0.5 to 2.0 parts per million may irritate, irritate the eyes, nose, and throat. So that's a thousand times over what we typically see indoors. So this comes from health effects associated with like, working in the industry. But keep in mind that people who live in their homes are with that all day, all night, breathing it from their bedrooms when they sleep. And so over time, that chemical sensitivity can develop with PPB levels. And that's why the, uh, the national organizations include the you know, PPB levels as being what you need to be careful about. Right. So there's a difference between acute exposure right. and long-term exposure. This is, yeah, so, but this is what you find in the literature if you go try to find something about formaldehyde. You're not going to find anything for a home that's, you know, long -term exposure. right. Other than the fact that who and, you know, we have these recommendations. Everything you see on this next, well, uh, I'm getting to it soon. Um, I don't have that much left. So, so again, ENT is what the eyes, nose, and throat are what are, um, and we, you generally it leads to asthma, chronic obstructive, or COPD. Those are the types of issues that come from formaldehyde. That's why I'm saying a lot of people ignore formaldehyde testing, only think about VOCs, and don't realize that the silent respiratory distress is coming from the formaldehyde. Okay? Yes. Oh. Given you a thumb. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. I have a question. So, naturally occurring formaldehyde is still bad for you? That's yeah. I mean, it's formaldehyde in the air. Yes. Well, whatever you're breathing, formaldehyde would be naturally. But, again, you, the, the key is to keep it low. So, low would mean better materials of construction and minimize the amount of, you know, I mean, you can have the really, there are really good floors out there that are wood that don't give off much formaldehyde. Yes. Have you ever tested a log cabin home? Um, I don't remember anybody ever. Yet. Not that I can think of yet. Yet. No. <laughs> yes. The wood. Well, the coatings, if they have some type of a, of a formaldehyde base, then it could be the coating. But typically, it's the wood. Well, it's somewhere, somewhere just wax, right? Sorry, I have to sit for a minute. Is, is, is wax a problem? Um, no, that's usually the high. That would usually be like C10 to C20 alkanes, and al you know these are like heavy molecules that are going to be less solid. You know, those are going to be more like SVOC sometimes. Um, so is that that's uh, they're they're just lower volatility, so you're not breathing as much, but you're still breathing a bunch of hydrocarbons. Okay. Yeah, it's not formaldehyde though. How, how much is this like a classification problem? I mean, we, if I mean formaldehyde is a VOC, right? It is like a volatile organic. What is formaldehyde? Yes, it is. But like. But when we refer to it, you say people care about VOCs, but not about formaldehyde. Well, because formaldehyde doesn't, because it's so tiny, it does not show up on normal GCMS results for a VOC, and so you don't see it in your results. So VOC is used as a proxy? Right. So VOC, it is a VOC. So, so to take that further, in, yeah. in the layman's terms, the, the people that, that have a lot of the testing equipment, their testing equipment is not capable of picking up formaldehydes, period. Right, from normal VOC testing. So um, and what we use, we have a formaldehyde absorbent, which will pick it up, and it's going to be one of the next slides. And then that, then you can just heat it up and absorb, desorb that, and then you get your reading. And the people that classify themselves as your peers, they don't have that equipment? Uh, no, but they can get that equipment. You know, they can, but they don't have it. They don't have it. They, they're usually doing the, the VOC testing. That's the what about that or whatever? Is that um, it picks up general VOCs typically. General, you know, if you wanted to do a PPB from a, you know a general PPB from a, a Fubot or any kind of PID that's just picking up VOCs, you actually need to like normalize it to like hexane or something. So you have to choose because because it's a gas, you have to use the ideal gas law, which is a chemistry term. Um, in the ideal gas law, you have to take nanograms per liter times 24.04 divided by the molar mass of that compound to get the actual PPB. It's not just as simple as liquids where you do nanograms over, you know, micrograms per liter. It's not just that simple. So, 
So every compound has a different PPB based on that. To give you a little bit more on that, because I do talk with people regularly, the VOCs themselves, those PIDs or those monitors, you kind of indicated they're $200, they, they don't last that long. They actually really should be replaced every year because the, the technology that they have within them does break down. It's never going to be as, a, um, as detailed as a $100,000 GC mass spec sitting in a laboratory. Right. The difficulty with it getting on the sorbent is formaldehyde, like I said, is right in that middle range where it's actually so small of a molecule that it doesn't stick onto a lot of the sorbents that many laboratories and many manufacturers of indoor air quality testing equipment would consider a VOC, which is why that's tricky. And but I, I, I thank you for that distinction because there's been many, many of us have all had IQ testing, and they always mm -hmm. say, well, we don't do formaldehydes. Okay. And then it's like, oh, okay. And then you just follow the thing. Right. We don't, we don't have the knowledge that you mm -hmm. folks have. Right. But the, the fact that not only do you, you have the knowledge, you have the equipment, but you're doing it, that's the distinction to drive home. That yeah. If they don't have that equipment, they're not really giving you the testing that you guys are giving. Okay. But, okay, you can, you can test it, but are you saying that it's hard to test even with what you guys do? We have two different types of material to do so because our standard tube, um, if you think about, well, I'll expose it a bit more, and I think you have a slide on our thermal desorption yeah. tubes too, but it has little, I call them little lava rocks in them, um, but they're activated carbons that have very small crevices, and what happens is we have three different types, and as the air passes through, the molecules or the chemicals get stuck in those little crevices. The problem is, is that formaldehyde is so small, it speeds right past most normal sorbents. So we, as a lab, have created a different tube. And many other labs can actually do it, but they are required to use a different type of testing media, which is why when we say formaldehyde and VOCs, we do kind of keep them a little bit separate. It is a major concern in a residential or even commercial space, but it's not generally put with the VOCs. Okay. And Curtis, I know I started late, so how much time do I actually have left? It's 12 after, I know. Um, yeah. 15 minutes? Okay, I just want to know. Thanks. So I can do that. One more question. So urea formaldehyde is also a, too small of a molecule to test for VOCs? Urea formaldehyde is actually a polymer, and it decomposes to give off formaldehyde over time. So that is actually, um, in, the, in the sense of volatility, it's non-volatile totally, unless it's decomposing. <laughs> so all polymers are non-volatile because they, they are uh, like... They could have a, ma a molar mass of like a hundred thousand to a million, but it's when they break apart that they form the small molecules again. So, yes. Uh, I think some of that, um, so I think what you're saying is instead of um, so as designers we should be listening to the direction we've been given and avoiding formaldehyde and not trying to mitigate it or dilute it or source control it after it's already in the space. That would be the best thing. And actually, I've got, I, it might be a good segue into my next slides then. So good, good question. Um, I did not know him before I showed up, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, this, um, this right here shows you all the different types of particulate matter that can be trapped by, let's say, an electric, that was not supposed to say right air. I'm sorry, that was supposed to be like crossed out, but it's an electrostatic air cleaner is what it's supposed to be, okay? And I honestly didn't know that was still said that. But um, so all those different things. But look down at the very bottom, at the very left-hand side, and that is the micro. So notice down at the very bottom, it says formaldehyde diameter is 0 0.0001 micrometer, which is down where it says particle diameter microns. That would be down in that area for a typical pollutant. So the bottom line is electrostatic filters and HEPA filters are not going to pick up VOCs. You're just trapping particulate, OK? And so. The, what, how we do do this for, the, so the detection real quickly is, there's a DNPH method that requires cold storage. So you have to ship it overnight in a, in a box containing frozen material, okay? So it stays cold. Um, the Hansch method is what we use. It's a fluorescing agent, it's very specific. And you can send it back your tube in a normal box and it can come back five days later and you're fine. We have a new instrument that we're testing it's not, ready, it's not ready for prime time yet, but it's called the Gassera formaldehyde monitor. It's even more specific because it uses photoacoustic IR spectroscopy. You even have less um, interferences. 
The thing about the DNPH method is there are interferences for any ketone or aldehyde you may trap, and you have to separate that all out in a long chroma chromatographic experiment using that liquid. Sorry? How is that first one tested typically? Using li liquid chromatography. Okay. And then so they send you a tube that's cold, and you have to keep it cold because the flur okay. you derivatize it on the tube as, as it's cold. We trap formaldehyde on our tubes, and it goes and gets derivatized in the instrument. So that's, the, that's the big distinction. Um, and so this is the DNPH showing that you have to separate it out. So here's uh, acetone coming out on the right-hand side. There's formaldehyde, the little small peak. Um, DNPH is the first large peak that's listed there. And so again, you have interfering species and you have to trap and you have to send it out cold. Um, and this is, the, this is pretty much the chemistry that occurs. I don't really need to focus on that. But the, the main thing here is it requires cold storage and you need to get it there by the next day. Um, and then finally, the Hans reaction, which is what's used in the fluorimeter we use, is an in situ, meaning it happens inside the instrument. And so your formaldehyde stays trapped on the adsorbent as it's being shipped to us does not leak out. And then we um, do this reaction with different tubes and end up getting something that absorbs light at 400. I mean, it's, this is the technical details on the bottom, which isn't necessary with the uh, time I have remaining. But this is uh, the instrument that reads out the PPB. Um, and then this is the, the way the instrument looks and how all those strippers pull together and um, the reactions, the stripping solution, the Hans reagent, all those come together and form um, your substrate, which goes into the fluorimeter, you get the signal processing and you have your formaldehyde result. And so we have some very few potential interferences. And um, again, these are like one in, some of those are as high as one in 300,000. Like the, the signal is very low compared to the formaldehyde signal. Um, I'm not gonna spend any time on this. Again, it comes down to just look, and we were, I was comparing here the prism versus NIOSH. I'd rather get to a few other things before we finish up. Um, so this is our photoacoustic spectroscopy system now that will do it based on uh, the specific absorption line of formaldehyde from that mid-IR range. Uh, again, very specific. We'll use the same tubes, but we'll now have a better method of detection. We'll use both interchangeably. Um, and then, but these are the results from 6,900 indoor air samples. That's what I wanted to get to, this last information. Um, and the average is approximately 50 nanograms per liter from all these homes. The, the high point up there is 50 nanograms per liter. But we have plenty of high results. Notice how many samples have higher than 100. You know, 5 and 10% of the samples come back being elevated. And again, that comes down to the information regarding, you know, what kind of uh, exposure they have in their home for uh, VOCs, you know, related to formaldehyde. Um, Okay, now I don't need to show this one. Let me get on to, uh, so I wanted to show you just briefly the instrument we have. Um, this is our mass spectrometer, and you can see the thermal desorption tubes. They have three different adsorbents in here. This is not working because it only, but we have three different adsorbents that trap various species, and then they go one at a time into the mass spectrometer, which then gives you information. And there's the mass spectrometer and the GC column on the right-hand side. And we have five of those in our lab now. And uh, usually they're running um, pretty much around the clock. And this would be a typical 1100 nanogram per liter TVOC from a home sample. And this next one is gonna be from a diesel fuel, which looks like this. Uh, and that's what you actually are breathing in your home, all those diesel fumes. Uh, starting at like time 16 minutes all the way out through time 35 minutes. It's probably in the range of carbon nine through about carbon 13, carbon 14 maybe, but it's a lot. Um, so these are the concentration units. I mentioned this earlier, but uh, you know the one nanogram per liter in the conversions, I, I have it in between the bars down below. That is equivalent to one microgram per cubic meter. And so again, the bottom line is that you convert nanograms per liter over to PPB using the, the molecular weight. But on the top there, the nanogram per liter are typical indoor reporting units. Then the microgram per cubic meter is the typical lead reporting units. And then we have milligram per meter cube for many OSHA limits. That just goes to show that we really don't have anything that tells us what we should have in the home. PPM for industry, PPB for typical indoor. Uh, so it's really kind of, um, you know, it's really not very good out there for the homes yet as far as trying to figure out what's acceptable. Because this is what you normally see. This is uh, benzene and the limit there is, it's right there in the middle, exposure limits, NIOSH. Um, 
relative exposure level of 0.1 ppm. Now that is 1,000 p, 1.1 ppm is 100 ppb. Um, so that is kind of low for the benzene. So at least the benzene is fairly low, uh, which it should be. Okay, last thing I wanted to cover tonight then is these are the current values for OSHA for formaldehyde. The World Health Organization says 100, down to, you know, France has 50 and 10, Germany 120, uh, NIOSH says 20. And that's really difficult. So anytime somebody gets a report back from us greater than 20, it's going to be moderate. It's not, you know, you can't say it's not because NIOSH says keep it down below 20. But again, these are all recommended levels. And uh, at the Indoor Air Quality Association meeting last year, there was a presenter saying within the next three to five years, there will be some federal regulation for formaldehyde exposure. Finally, you know, something that everybody will have to follow. Um, in the workplace or at home? In the, at homes. Oh, well, you know, the, like instead of like 20 or 100, they're gonna say, this is no longer a recommended level, this is what it should be. You know, this is like the guideline now. Like, if you look at OSHA and NIOSH, those are law for industrial. But the NIOSH is recommended for like homes, like when you see that kind of information. Um, the last thing I want to mention, there's a little bit of confusion with CARB-2 testing. Everybody thinks that CARB-2 testing will tell you the amount of formaldehyde in your home. CARB-2 testing is Cal California Air Resource Board. They you put a specific board into a specific spectrometer at a specific mass and temperature, and you measure the amount of formaldehyde that comes from that. That's how they determined that the lumber liquid air boards were not in compliance. But you can take those boards that are not in compliance, and if you have good enough exposure, a good enough um, air circulation in your home, they will be acceptable in your home. They will not be giving you high VOC levels as long as you have good um, airflow. But if you have poor airflow, high humidity, high temperature, you're going to have formaldehyde issues, even maybe from a good floorboard. So that was the thing here. The CARB-2 testing has these types of standards for the different types of products. So there it's saying it's acceptable to have 110 ppb from a medium density fiber board. Okay, that is acceptable. So you decide you want to put that in your home, then that's what you're setting yourself up for as a homeowner, you know, to do that, to bring in that kind of a... It's a big difference from 20. Yes, it is. If it's, if it's encapsulated with paint, are you okay? Um, typically, yeah. But then they would do a probably a carb two test to show that it's okay. And there's no, I mean, like, you, this is this property materials is just assumed to be permanent, right? Like so, a certain piece of wood after ten or fifteen or twenty years, it's still going to be emitting the same. Yeah, probably. Last thing, uh, well, actually, there's one more little tidbit after this, but so this is what I was saying: higher temperature, you get more VOCs; higher formaldehyde levels, lower temperature. It's obvious that you get fewer VOCs. Humidity is important, high, high humidity, high formaldehyde, if you have a formaldehyde source. And then airflow, the higher you have the airflow, the lower all your VOCs will be. And then the lower the airflow, the more VOCs you'll have. So it's all, it's all interchangeable, yes? So, okay, so there's VOCs everywhere, even in the nature. Yes. Hasn't anybody come up with something to absorb this? Yes. Like carbon, well, something. Well, and that's what, and that's what I was going to finish up with. Just a, a couple of comments about, you know, you can use air cleaners. You know, any air cleaner with a carbon bed absorbent will work. Um, don't you guys sell like formaldehyde absorbing like um, insulation? We have. We have. That's what I thought. It says it right on the product. It absorbs formaldehyde. That's a solution. Even IKEA came out with like. Yeah. Things that have an activated carbon in them that you can use in the space. They only last yeah. for a week. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you can you can remediate, and that's what I was going to say next was just here. Here's my bottom line wisdom from all this, everybody. So this, these la next three slides are really important. Okay. So, if possible, the best way to improve indoor air quality is to remove or reduce the source of contamination. When that isn't possible, then the next best approach is to improve ventilation and add fresh outdoor air where practical. When this isn't possible, then uh, filtration, air cleansing is necessary. And that's when you put in maybe uh, carbon air filters. And I will just tell you this. 
I throw caution to the wind about any kind of, a, of an air cleaner that involves the use of any kind of technology that is going to ionize it or whatever, because ozone creates, filtrate, uh, creates formaldehyde. Um, and it's very, like, very obvious from samples received that formaldehyde is generated when the use of ozone generating equipment is used to cleanse the home of odors. Now, it may be temporary, but ozone attacks double bonds and your paint on your walls will start peeling if you use enough of it. Is this, it's going to do if you have in if you have like rubber goggles or something within like a week they'll be like shattered they'll, they'll just be like disintegrating due to ozone exposure. And, yeah, and if you ever want to know what ozone smells like, take your old um, transformer from your model railroad and just turn it on slightly so that you can feel the arcing effect and go real close to it you can smell that really sharp acrid odor that comes from formaldehyde because that's what's happening you have an arc uh, me I have I figured out like 30 years later what I was breathing but at least I know now um, but anyway so the bottom line and is that you know whole house is ozonation you just need to be careful use it wisely if you're going to use it use it for a couple of hours at a time maybe at the most to make sure nobody's home I'm, I'm still not real sure about all the they use the chlorine dioxide uh, for also you know re remediation effects I'm still investigating all that I'm actually giving a talk at the uh, Northeast indoor air quality meeting in uh, Portland Maine and on Halloween day regarding the use of um, of all types of filtration devices. We don't sell filtration devices, but I've investigated it, and I just, uh, you know, it ended up being a good topic to give a talk on. And so uh, that's what I'm there to do, be very objective about it, and just say, you know, I don't want anybody to think they shouldn't use anything, but just give the facts. Um, I, and it, f final thing, uh, somebody had an RV, they had 50 nanograms per liter formaldehyde in their RV, and they wanted to remediate that. They used ozone for 24 hours and the results came back 200 nanograms per liter after they were finished. So that tells you a little bit about the effect of ozone on materials of construction in an enclosed environment for a 24 hour period. So anyway, in conclusion, I hope that, you know, this has kind of like opened your eyes to a lot of uh, materials of construction and things like that, that, you know, I, I just tried to provide a broad base of some information that could maybe be useful for you as you design things and as you encourage other people to do a better job of what they bring into their homes and things. So in closing, I just wanted to, uh, you know, I, I wanted to thank my, um, my uh, research advisor, Alice D'Elia, um, my lab manager, for allowing me to be able to come here today. And also thanks to uh, Sarah for attending and helping out with this. So thank you for your um, attention, and I appreciate all the, the conversation beforehand and afterwards. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, so, for uh, I totally agree that the best strategy for air quality is source control, like before yeah. getting to filtration or anything. Right. Uh, but the problem is, like, all these certification, like, fierce is like passive house is promoting it, yeah. more uh, ventilation, like, lead is promoting, like, ASHRAE 62.1, okay. like, quality testing, well is promoting air quality monitoring. But the real question is, uh, air quality, uh, I mean, all these are the, the things that we can use after the building is getting built. Do we have uh, any tool or anything that we can simulate during the design to really play with all these, these players, like ventilation system, materials, geometry, mm -hmm. opening size, and everything, to provide more kind of measurable values? other than waiting until the end of the project and do, I've, I've seen that they touted, they did everything right, but at the end there was something wrong and someone like applied some sort of adhesive somewhere that kind of like yeah, and it's a really good question. I honestly don't know. I know that you know we have a lot of experts here. Is, is does that exist? Any kind of uh, like pr computer programs that can help in development and design phases? CFD. But CFD cannot really kind of like there is, a, there is a tool, like EPA has a tool, IQX, that has the off-casting time and everything okay. can simulate, but that is really simpl simplified. Like with CFD, you can't really give the off-casting time of the each material. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a problem with that, but 
I think if if we can have that tool in the market, it would be yeah. Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it's a really good question. It's actually a really good, you know, thought concept there. Thank you. Has anyone heard of or I guess um, know of the house project that they were doing up in Colorado where they had a home kind of looking at the ins and outs of the indoor air quality as a whole? They had it in a university. I wonder if that might be something that like drop them a line, see if they'll do that, something similar. There was a university in Colorado that had done I believe so. Okay. Well, which, I'll look at it for sure. Certain things, you know. What is your initiative you were mentioning earlier? Um, well, at, we have slides over? Yeah, it, it's great Wait. to actually be the next slide. Oh, so, perfect. Uh, Segway. I knew it was yeah, coming. Yeah, good segue. Thanks, Steve. Where's the little ticker? I also want to um, mention yeah, that's that fine. Yeah. there is a previous slide for any CPHC that we have in the room. Um, Jason, if you would go back maybe two slides first. Where uh, we are offering the CPU credit. Is this the one? Uh, it's the bottom oh, arrow. No, it's, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it's the bottom arrow. We'll go forward. Or backwards will be the top arrow. Yeah, there you go. And maybe you can just hold this in your hand so you can get it on the tape. Just hold it with you. What is this? It's the, the audio for his camera. Oh. The, you don't have to talk into it. Just, I think if you just hold it, you're probably fine. I got too many. I don't have three hands. Yeah, that's good. Everybody write down? All right. You had something else up here, Steve. Yeah, th I think it got like sandwiched in between a couple of my slides. Yeah, th these are online resources. I'm gonna, you know, you guys can have a copy of these slides so you can get this, or you can take a picture of it. Uh, it's just various different, uh, like it talks about California Air Resource Board and etc. I just didn't want to take up any more time. So. Okay, yeah. this is this was not um, intentionally totally planned, but I did tell Curtis that I was working on a research project. And we're actually looking at formaldehyde as one of the ways we're measuring it. Oh, cool. So I'm not sure exactly which capture method we're using, but you can see um, some preliminary results. This is a Building America. Everybody heard of the Building America program, DOE funded research? No, tell us about it. All right, so I'm a project manager for this awesome initiative. Free resource, awesome data, all kinds of cool, the Building Science Advisor tool. Great resource if you're looking at various wall assemblies and want to know how they're going to perform in various climates from a moisture durability perspective, et cetera. Um, so I'm working with a team here um, called the Partnership for Advanced Residential Retrofits. And we're looking at indoor air quality measures in existing homes that are going through a home performance upgrade, right? So if you're getting weatherized or um, energy improvements, uh, we're looking at across. So the, the team includes MIA, Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Um, uh, Paul Francisco and Bill Rose from the University of Illinois. Uh, uh, Paul was actually the former chair of the 62.1, uh, or 62.2 committee. Um, and the National Center for Healthy Housing as well. So we're working on homes. Um, we have a goal of 40 homes. Uh, and we're doing pre and post measurements for a, a, a selection of packages that are either like baseline typical weatherization measures or treatment measures that are more advanced, which would actually the hypothesis is we should be air sealing not just at the ceiling plane, but at the bottom plane, right, the basement level as well, if we really care about controlling the indoor air quality. So some of the initial data that we've seen so far, um, this is actually a little bit out of data. I had an hour long call on this today uh, with the team and we're actually seeing between, uh, it's a little bit confusing, it's pre and, pre and post meetings, pre and post means. Um, this is actually now, we're, we're, we're going from uh, over 1,000 down below 1,000 between before and after. So every home is getting exhaust ventilation and some homes are getting the supply side ventilation too. And we're kind of seeing if one works better than the other. So there's lots of little dynamics to this. Um, testing radon, CO2. Um, I don't have a, the, the data on all the air flows, but we're doing blower door tests, total leakage outside, and duct testing, total leakage duct testing, all kinds of fun performance testing on existing homes to see what the differences is, differences are from pre and post um, air sealing. And um, generally what we've seen so far is that by in installing some controlled ventilation system, like an exhaust fan, in addition to controlling um, air flows and reducing infiltration, we're seeing decreases across most in, indoor air quality measures that we're evaluating. 
um, including moisture, right? So the homes are getting drier, which is a good thing from a building science perspective. Um, and they're getting, and, and contaminant levels in general are decreasing as well. Um, note the, um, the scale for formaldehyde to fit all in one graph, you have to multiply the number by a thousand uh, to get the, the parts per billion. So, where, oh, there's my advancer, sorry. Um, and the cool thing here is that um, I have money to give out and I need help. So, uh, we're looking for homes that want to participate. That if you're, so if you're thinking about a weatherization project this winter and want some uh, fairly significant money, please contact me. Uh, we're looking for single family homes that have a single heating system. Here's Bill Rose, the guy who wrote the book, Moisture in Buildings. Awesome dude. Um, we should get him up here sometime to do a, a presentation. He'd be really good. Uh, all kinds of instrumentation. Um, so we're doing plenum pressures, we're doing duct blasting, all kinds of stuff. So if you have a home that meets some of these criteria um, and or you're a contractor doing work on existing homes uh, and want to help contribute to the research body of what happens to indoor air quality before and after um, energy improvements, let me know. Um, we, we, like I said, the data, we, we don't have this, we're planning to finish this by the end of the year and have a full report published with a lot more data. Um, I can tell you across the 20 home, 23 homes that we've done so far, formaldehyde levels on uh, almost all the homes, except for one I think, are below the um, uh, 20 um, yeah, threshold. Yeah. There were one that was uh, higher before, um, and it's still higher afterwards, but it's not as high. So it's decreasing, but it still has some pretty big sources there. So, yes, Tony. You said you're doing blower door tests. What, yeah. what kind of ranges are these devices falling? Yeah, the, so that's a graph I didn't have here, uh, but um, generally we're seeing a reduction of, of about 5 ACH between before and after. Yeah. So. This is great. This was began in that, with, with FY15 money, which means it began in 2016. So uh, well before, you know, um, I was working with GTI. And uh, we've gotten three no-cost time extensions, but that, um, that's, we're pretty much at like a, the final point. Like, okay, we're done in August. We have what we have at that point. Uh, we'd like to get more data though. So we only have 23 or 24 we homes now. We have to, so we do a three week monitoring period pre improvements. Then the contractor does whatever they're going to do. Then we come back afterwards and do three weeks afterwards. What was that? During occupancy. During occupancy, yes. And it has to be during the same season. So it could be both in cooling season because we got to keep windows closed, right? So it's normalized because they were living in a cooling Yeah, right. We don't expect occupancy changes. Yeah. Difficult. Yeah. Right. Trip.